first and foremost, thank you all for showing up. Thank you all for showing up. This is a big deal for me. I feel like a vision has come to fruition here. I love the saying, where people are, psychology is. And it just kind of highlights that psychology is omnipresent. Wherever an individual is, psychology exists, right? Because they have a mind, they have emotions, they're behaving. And then especially where people are, psychology is. And then where you have a psychology panel talking to psychology students, psychology really is potently present. So I just love it. Like this is, this is our world. And I know for so many of you, this is already like your world. You want to step into this world of psychology. You have a passion for understanding people, helping people at a time when that is so badly needed. So, so thank you for showing up. I trust that this will be very meaningful. Let's dive in. So the first question I, I was, I, uh, I think I told you in an email that maybe you can speak to this first question for approximately six, seven, eight minutes. And if once six minutes passes, Professor Campelli will hold up a little sign just so that you don't have to think too much about the timing. Yep. Um, and, and the first question is just, can you introduce yourself and describe the work that you do and how that work is fulfilling to you? So maybe we can use two microphones for the panel. Anyone feel compelled to go first? Then I well, shall. Age before beauty. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> then here you first are. Of all, the, the first challenge is for an educator to speak less than three hours is going to be a challenge. <laughs> but you said six minutes. So okay, I'll do my best. I'm Mark Stanford. I currently met Cabrillo College in the Department of Psychology, and um, I also am a consultant, a clinical consultant for Monterey County, Santa Cruz County, and Santa Clara County. The focus I do of my clinical consultation and trainings is helping people raise the standard of care using evidence-based treatments for stabilizing pers persons with compulsive, out-of-control addiction and co-occurring disorders. Prior to that, um, I was the director of addiction and pain medicine in the Santa Clara County Health and Hospital System. And then after that, I was uh, actually first I was a director of a nonprofit clinic and then went to the county of Santa Clara. Um, I've been teaching for about 35 years. I found that, uh, that, a, that a profession in psychology was really versatile. And I like to pivot my career in different facets of the industry. So I love administrative work because I can research and help to establish policy that actually works on behalf of the clients we're serving. I can do clinical work at a private practice, the Psychiatric Medical Group in San Jose, for years focusing on depression and anxiety. I, it was very fulfilling in helping people connect the dots on their own to improve the quality of their life uh, for longer periods of time. It was nothing I do. I just set up stop signs and encourage them through motivational interviewing to read them and to make changes and try it out like an experiment. And then I loved edu being an educator for almost 35 years. I taught at San Jose State Graduate School of Social Work, uh, Stanford University in the Department of Psychiatry. That was really cool. Teaching physicians who don't get anything in addiction medicine and yet probably a third of their patients, regardless of their discipline, that means whether they're OBGYN, geriatrics, internal medicine, family medicine, about a third of their patients are gonna have serious and consequential substance use disorders. And not one mention is usually made about that. And so at Stanford, we were changing that, that paradigm to help facilitate change in that direction. And I'm happy to say that all 150 physicians at Santa Clara County Health and Hospital System routinely screen and do brief intervention and referral. So that was, that's another fulfilling aspect about being a part of this industry. But I, I just wanted to share with you that it was really fulfilling because um, it's very versatile, the industry of psychology. There's so many facets of it. One thing I'm not going to have time for because I'm aging out 
is I really wanted to check out forensic psychology and do psychological autopsies. Yes, um, but no time. Anyway, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Well, I guess I'm going second when I thought I was going third. Um, but my name is Ashley Meeks. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I currently have a part-time private practice as well as I do community-based work um, at Rebecca's Children's Services. So I work with children and adolescents and families. Um, a lot of what I do has to do with trauma um, and working with kids and adolescents and families who have some type of trauma. Prior to that, I worked at a school and I did, I dabbled in school-based therapy um, as well as I was a SPED coordinator. So I read, ugh, I wrote all of the behavior intervention plans for SPED students. I ran SEL groups, um, which is social emotional learning. Um, so it was a new curriculum that was implemented in schools to help kids talk about feelings. Um, so I did that for a while. And then before that, I actually was a behavioral therapist. So I worked with children on the autism spectrum. Um, so I am all things kids and adolescents, and I really love it. So if you ever think you might want to work with kids, I can definitely give you a whole lot of advice. It's great. It's super fulfilling. Um, I love the work that I do because I get to help change lives and change families. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from working with kids is that you get to see progress daily. Um, and so like every session where there's these very small wins, but it, it's life changing for them. And so I think that's what keeps me coming back and working with kids and teens um, because they're, they're our next generation. They will be you guys very shortly. And so they're always working and willing to grow. And so I just really love all things kids. I'm going to kick it this way. <laughs> hey, I'm quick. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Souza. I currently work as a socio-emotional counselor for Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'm there eight years now. And I really love what I do. Um, it's not always easy, and I don't love it every single day. <laughs> but for whatever reason, I can do this and still kind of be OK, which is my goal. So um, I, I work a lot with trauma. Originally, this um, position that I have, I started the second year that it was developed at PVUSD. And I was really lucky to kind of come in on the ground. And what had happened was that they had uh, done an LCAP survey. Who knows what an LCAP survey? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. So that's where it's your local something and control. Here, you got it. <laughs> local control accountability plan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and what they had done is identified that there was such a need for uh, social emotional services within the schools. And so our position was created primarily at first for our at-risk youth. Um, it's now all youth. Yeah, they're all at risk. <laughs> you know, we know that. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Um, the job, I've done different things. When I um, started off with my bachelor's degree, I was double major music and psychology, and I thought they went really well together and was thinking about going into music therapy. I've dabbled in that a little bit. And then I decided to take a break. And I know that is controversial, especially if you only have a bachelor's in psychology, right? <laughs> and so, um, but I decided I wanted to get kind of hands on. And so I had the opportunity to work for a really wonderful um, organization, one of the larger nonprofit mental health organizations in California. It used to be called Alliance for Community Care. Now it's called Momentum. And that was an, a fantastic experience for me, getting in on the ground as um, kind of an entry level counselor. I worked my way up a bit. But so much of what I do today is because of that time that I took off and and kind of explored a little bit on my own, met a lot of professionals. It was very, very valuable. And um, how I ended up in schools is I moved out of the country for a couple of years and I really wanted to be a part of the country and work. I was uh, living in Mexico and I um, ended up getting an opportunity to be a school counselor. So I never thought I wanted to be a school counselor, um, but getting that opportunity was 
life changing for me. It's like this is where I want to be because I love adolescents. That is my population that I really just am near and dear uh, to my heart. And so being in schools, I got to see them in their environment, <laughs> not in an office somewhere, right? And I just love that. I love seeing them running around and doing their sports or having the tough day that they're having. And so when I came back, that's when I hopped into the PPSC program, Pupil Personnel Services Credential, and was able to go on with teaching and also um, with school counseling in the U.S. And that's what I've been doing since. So I will pass it. Sure. This way. All right. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Josh Ramirez. Um, I'm the mental health counselor here at Gavlin. Um, I also uh, do some work for a couple nonprofit agencies doing therapy at those locations. Um, yeah, so a couple populations besides um, transition age youth like you guys. Um, I work with veterans. Um, and then otherwise, I work with um, adults with depression and anxiety for the most part. Um, yeah, but how I got there, I'm trying to make sure that I offer something useful to you guys. Um, maybe I'll share a little background of how I grew up, because maybe if you find that there's some similarities, maybe you find that, okay, maybe this might be a good position for me one day. Um, growing up, I kind of always um, wanted to help people. I kind of always wanted to, like, be there for people. And I think, I, I don't know, I was always drawn to people, I don't know, my, my best friend, uh, had a lot of suicidality, right? And I just really wanted to be there for him, right? And I was always there for him. And I, for some reason, I don't know if they were drawn to me or I was drawn to them, but somehow they would be, and I'd run into more people and I'd just want to help. Um, of course, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just being there. Um, yeah, and then my parents separated at my senior year, right? And I just thought, dang, I think, I think it could have really worked, but I don't know why it didn't. And, uh, and that was kind of just like a little nugget in my head for a long time. I proceeded to kind of get my communications degree in my bachelor's and in my AA um, and was kind of lost and didn't really know what I wanted to do. And somehow I floundered into teaching. And so I was teaching for a while. And uh, I found that the most val I mean, for me, the most enjoyable moments were when students would come to me with their problems, right? And they would come talk to me. And so you kind of see where it was started going after a while. Um, and so I said, why don't I just like try to do something like this for a living? And that's when I took my degree path into social work and um, proceeded to get my master's. Um, and then since then, I've worked with, you know, a couple different populations. I've worked um, with the homeless population. I've worked with um, single mothers through the CalWORKs program. Um, and then I already mentioned veterans and you guys. Um, but yeah, um, it's very rewarding. It's really draining. It can be really like you have to make sure you have really strong boundaries because sometimes if you're if you're like me and you want to help, you'll pour out a little bit too much. You know, what I mean, you'll like give too much to yourself because you want you're like, no, we need to do a little bit more. Right. Like they need me or something. Right. They need help. Um, but you have to set up those boundaries. Right. Because it's not about you. Right. It's about them. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I guess I'll leave it off. So, hi everyone, my name is Jasmine Lopez, and I am with Santa Clara County's Behavioral Health Services Department. And in our department, we have a prevention services division. In that division, we have the Substance Use Prevention Services Program, and we also have the Suicide Prevention Program. And my role really consists of overseeing the school-based prevention services, so all our K through 12 work on both sides of the division. And so for you to understand what I do, I kind of have to tell you where I started. So I'll get into my education. I think that's one of the next questions. But I initially started my career in school mental health, suicide prevention world over eight years ago. Did not plan on it, and I'll get to that later. But in doing this work, I started at Stanford Medicine's um, Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And what they had there was a school mental health program. And it fit with where my graduate studies were. So I thought, all right, this is a pretty cool opportunity. But what does that even mean? And I'll bring that up a lot. Sometimes I had all these questions of what this career path looked like or what school mental health really meant. So as I started my career and I started this position, I realized really early on 
it was really heavy on suicide prevention and mental health literacy. And what I mean by that is that we were going into predominantly high school classrooms talking about suicide. And if you were concerned about yourself or a loved one, where would you go for a referral? What would you do? What should you do versus not talking about suicide? And this really stemmed from the clusters of suicide. If you can Google this and you'll see some horrible articles, but early 2010 to 2015, there were two clusters of suicides where we were losing youth in our community. And there was a study that was done in Santa Clara County around what, what is happening. And when the study came out, and you can also look that up, the CDC actually came out and did the study with the county. And it just really showed that Palo Alto and Morgan Hill had the highest rates of youth suicide deaths. And so what we were doing at Stanford at the time was really going into the Palo Alto School District and also the North Bay area and really going into the classroom talking about depression, talking about suicide, anxiety, and really just having these conversations to reduce stigma. And the whole point is we need to be talking about mental health. And I think your generation or just the younger generation is doing such a great job talking about it. Whereas when I graduated high school in 2005, I cannot even recall ever talking about mental health in high school. And let me tell you, I could have used a couple of conversations. Mm -hmm. So all of that happened while I was at Stanford. We were working with community partners, so local clinicians, both uh, medical doctors, pediatricians, clin um, mental health clinicians, school district leads, nurses, really just trying to see what trends we were seeing in the community and how we as a local, local group could really work in collaboration with school districts and community partners. Fast forward a little bit, when I left Stanford, I joined County Behavioral Health, County of Santa Clara Behavioral Health, where there was a suicide prevention program that was trying to do a lot, not just for the youth, not just for K-12, but also for trans transitional age youth, so college students, right, going into the universities and talking about mental health, talking to our middle-aged adults, talking to our older adults. So the lifespan is what the program really focused on. And in my role, I was really overseeing trainings. And what we do as part of the suicide prevention program for the county is that we do look at the coroner reports and the suicide deaths, and we do deep dive analyses to see what trends we're seeing, what populations are affected, and where we need to be really targeted in our messaging, whether that's campaign, whether that's going out and doing trainings and having these difficult conversations, but also being mindful that every community is different if you consider this work that we do, and if you're talking about psychology, culture is huge. And when I talk about culture, I don't, don't just mean racial ethnic background, I do mean, or religion, I do mean sexual orientation, gender identity, I mean age. My parents never talked about mental health. I'm cool talking about mental health. So there is this generational difference when we're talking about all of this that we do, and I'm sure that the rest of the panel can agree that we encounter different challenges when we work with different populations. So really in this role that I have with county, I'm just really privileged to connect with different communities. And I won't say that fulfilling is the word. I feel like there's a purpose to this work and it gives me hope and I get emotional sometimes because it's just really frustrating that it's taken so long to get to this point where we are openly talking about mental health and openly having these conversations that may seem awkward but we need to be having these conversations because we are losing kids and we're losing loved ones that aren't just, you know, we're losing fifth graders, we're using middle schoolers, high schoolers, we're losing parents, grandparents, and it is a real issue in our community. And I think about California is a lot different, the Bay Area is a lot different, Santa Clara County is a lot different than the rest of the nation. We trend differently. And I, if you ever are interested in knowing more suicide information, I can share that with you. But we are kind of in this together and having to look out for one another. And it doesn't hurt to have a training on two or how to approach someone regarding suicide. So pass it on to Nicole. Okay. Uh, and this is a beautiful, one of the ways, um, I think our county in general, Santa Clara County just has really beautiful connections. So actually Dr. Stanford, your work, um, I've heard about you. I've, I think I've probably been in spaces with you before through the county, Child Abuse Council and other things. So thank you for your work. Um, my name is Nicole Stewart and I am a middle child. <laughs> I'll start there because that explains everything. <laughs> explains why I'm a social worker. Um, but I've been a social worker for 20 years, 21 years. Um, I got my, well, well, education is our next, okay. Um, 
I started my social work career in rape crisis and domestic violence. I did that for about six years in Connecticut, in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, helped run all the rape crisis centers in the state of Connecticut. Helped create legislation um, to require every hospital in the state to offer Plan B to rape victims when they come through. Um, and also train volunteers to answer the hotline uh, and do one-on-one -on -one work with student, with young people and survivors. Um, I burnt out in that job because I did not have good boundaries, as was suggested. And I also, at that point in my career as a baby social worker, didn't realize that my own trauma had been triggered by the work I was doing. Right? We often are drawn to the work that we, that we're, the work that we are often drawn to is what we might need to resolve in ourselves. Um, and it's a good reminder not to use our work as therapy, but to have therapy alongside our work so that we can um, identify those things. It was not made clear to me until I burnt out and my body started shutting down. Um, around the same time, my husband and I moved here to California. My husband got a uh, tenure track position at San Jose State. He's a San Jose State um, sociology professor. Um, so I came along with, and, and you know, as a social worker, I kind of knew I could get a job anywhere. And I started interviewing with rape crisis centers out here, and my husband very lovingly said, sweetheart, I love you, and you're a great social worker. Could you do anything but rape crisis? <laughs> because truly, it was impacting my relationship, right? I, I had a startle response anytime someone touched me and I couldn't see them first. Um, I was having intrusive thoughts, intrusive nightmares, things like that. Um, so this work really can impact us if we don't have those, those personal boundaries. So my brilliant idea was, I know, I'll go into another venue, as, as Dr. Stanford said, a pivot, right? I'll go into somewhere where there's no trauma at all. I'll go into education. <laughs> yeah, joke's on me, right? Plenty of trauma because at where people are, trauma is as well. Um, so I've been in schools now since 2005, or sorry, 2007. Um, and my technical um, title is I'm a school link services coordinator. So my job is paid through, partly through my district and partly through the county, Santa Clara County Office of Education, or sorry, um, Santa Clara County Behavioral Health, um, with the goal of increasing direct links to support services through schools, knowing that everybody goes through schools, right? Almost everybody is connected to a school, whether they have kids in that school, they've gone through that school, they live in the, in the same neighborhood as a school. And we are moving in our county toward community center schools, which is phenomenal. Um, in addition to my actual work as a social worker, um, Similarly to what's been said, I find myself in that role in a lot of different places. I was just recently in Cabo for a girlfriend's 40th birthday and found myself getting a disclosure from one of the um, party girls. <laughs> um, and also one of the women had uh, lost her husband to suicide. So it was a lot of counseling that I was doing. And I came home from that vacation going, why am I so exhausted? <laughs> it's like, oh, because I was on the whole time. Um, but I love being able to be that, that person in the spaces where I go. I'm also uh, a CASA, a court appointed special advocate for foster youth. I've also been a foster parent. Um, I say, for, it's hard to say I've been a foster parent. My kids are still in my life. I met them when they were 13, 14, and 15. Now they're 28, 29, and 30, actually about to be 31, 30, and 29, which is still hard for me to wrap my brain around. Um, but I am also a grandma. A little plug for, for fostering teenagers. I, I fostered teenagers when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, and um, I was a grandma by 38. Um, my babies call me Nana, so, um, but they're up in Seattle. I get to see them all the time. So um, big plug for advocating for foster youth and becoming a foster parent if you have room in your heart and your home. Um, I've also been um, part of the Child Abuse Prevention Council of Santa Clara County and a former chair, uh, and I currently sit on this, the child death review team for our county, which is exactly what it sounds like. Anyone under the age of 18 who passes in this county, we do a full review of autopsy and records reviews to find out what did we miss, or is there a trend that's happening that we need to warn public health about so that they can send something out. The biggest one has been safe sleep with infants. Right. Um, I know co-sleeping is a big thing, but infants, you know, it's very easy to roll over on a child when you're when you're exhausted as a parent. So um, unfortunately, that does happen a lot. But we also see the suicides and the homicides and the vehicle incidents that come through. Um, and that work, I've been on the CDRT for about 10 years now. Um, and I'm really proud that right now we're really looking at ACEs. We're looking at adverse childhood experiences when we do our records recheck to see where, at what point could we have intervened, right? Because the, the most adverse childhood impact is death. So what was, you know, how many DCF, CPS reports were made? How many bullying reports made to the school? How much, what was the truancy like in that for that kid? Like, could someone else have intervened at some point? And that's all just to give, us, give information back to the county, specifically behavioral health, but also like the DA's office and places like that where they can use that information. Um, and I'm also currently the, um, 
Vice President of the Board for the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth. Part of my job, I'm a social worker in schools. I'm actually the only social worker in my district, which is insane. It's, that's an anomaly. Most districts have one social worker per school. Um, mine has chosen not to invest in other social workers. Part of it, you know, they're like, oh, you're amazing, you do it all. And I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm constantly saying, how can we get more? How can we get more? Um, I, we've gone the intern route, but the challenge is the management of interns while also doing all the work. Um, so I'm hopeful that my, my school district will start to invest in more social workers, but we do have mental health counselors in our schools, which is super helpful. Um, I do work with social emotional learning. We have um, what we call um, MTSS, which is multiple tiered systems of support. Um, so we talk about like, how, what do we do for all kids? Every single kid gets some information or an assembly or some information. What do we do for a smaller group of kids? Maybe a, pulling a small group together, doing a restorative practice with kids. And then what is that tier three, those kids that really need our intervention, the kids that are smoking or on fire. I don't mean smoking, but like literally like smoke's coming out of their ears kind of, right? Um, and how can we support kids at every tier in the schools? And that's a big push through schools right now, um, as well as restorative practices. That's partly why I was running here. I, I've been in, part, in a training of trainers for restorative justice and restorative practices, um, not as a way of looking at just discipline and how we you know, suspend or expel kids, but really making sure we're showing up in a restorative mindset, in a like, oh, I'm curious about this, instead of like, that That has to go, we can't have that here. So we're moving away from zero tolerance policy, and in, in education, pendulums swing pretty hard, <laughs> um, and we're moving back to restorative and away from zero tolerance. Um, I'm also a yoga teacher and a sound healer, um, certified trauma-informed in both. I've worked for Art of Yoga Project, so we do yoga for girl, well, now we've expanded um, all genders, but it used to be specifically girls in juvenile hall, um, and the ranches. Two of my foster kids went through <laughs> juvenile hall and the ranch, so I'm very familiar. I visited every, they were my church every Sunday for a little while. Um, but really giving those kids, especially kids who have been impacted by trauma, the, the self-regulation tools, um, even just their breath and their movement. You know, I have a lot of kids, I've worked, um, part of my work with Art of Yoga Project was also in Oakland, working with girls who had been sex trafficked. And once they, they were brought in, you know, instead of arresting them and putting them in juvenile hall, they would actually do therape therapeutic support for them. Um, those girls love lavender oil and they love legs up the wall pose. That was like, they begged for that every time I went. Um, but I also um, facilitate yoga as healing for, Trump, for survivors of sexual abuse um, at both UC Berkeley and at Stanford. It's an eight week course um, and it's heavy on the yoga, but also understanding the, the body brain connection and really what's happening in our minds when, or in our brain with trauma, like that fight or flight response versus the rest and digest and, and how, we, how we use the breath and the body to regulate our emotions and our, and our needs. So I love my job. I love being a social worker. I agree with the pivoting. You know, maybe it's you figure out what it is you want to do and what skill set you have and then figure out, you know, there's so, we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but the breadth of the work you can do with a degree in psychology and social work, even in communication, my undergrad is communication. Um, there's a lot you can do. Uh, as a social worker specifically, you can do everything from being with you know, infants to elders. And I would just say less specifically, I'll get into that when we have the other question, but find, you've heard from many of the folks, like find the population that lights you up and, and go there. Like if you're all about little, the littles, do that. Um, if you're all about the elders, do that. I personally, teens are my jam. I love teens. And I know other people would run away from teenagers, right? Um, and I run toward them. Uh, even, even if they're running away from me, <laughs> sometimes they are. Um, but truly find that group. And, but don't close yourself off. Um, I mostly worked with young kids, and that got a little too heavy for me. So I started working with teens, and I, I got an opportunity to work with elders, and I didn't think I would like it, but I really enjoyed it. I haven't had another opportunity, but I think that might be my next pivot um, because there's so much richness. There's so many stories. There's so much... Uh, of a different perspective on life that I think sometimes we miss when we just stay with folks in our same peer group. So I encourage you, whatever it is that you find is your passion, just know that there's a breadth of ways to use it. Mm. Wow. I feel like I did a really good job recruiting a panel, didn't I? <laughs> um, maybe I'll, I'll give you this mic, but I'll, I'll kind of combine the next two questions. Um, I, I, as I was kind of promoting the event, I, was, I wanted to make sure that students knew that we were just going to be fully transparent. 
about everything that you really want to know, um, including what exactly does it take? What's the, what's the education path? How long are you going to be in school? Are you going to have to take on debt? Will that be paralyzing to you? What kind of lifestyle will a profession in psychology afford? And of course, as we'll hear, <clears throat> the, the spectrum is quite vast in terms of like how much money you can make or, or how much money you, may, you could go into debt, for example. So I just want to, you know, set us up to just be transparent and as private as you need to be um, as you answer the next question. Or the, and we'll make it two part. So the question is, can you speak to us about your education journey? including exactly which degrees you earned, and maybe some sub-questions that you can, you don't have to remember, but other questions could be like, how long did it take you? Um, did you have to take on debt? Were there scholarship opportunities? Um, what doors opened for you at each step of the way? Everyone here does have a graduate degree. And I did want to say in this moment that it, that is one of the things about a psychology degree that I actually find slightly frustrating, which is that a bachelor's degree doesn't open as many doors as, that, as a bachelor's degree in another field may open. And if you really want to specialize in the, to the level that our panelists have specialized in the field, it typically does require a graduate degree, you know, at least a master's, which will take two more years beyond the bachelor's. But I wanted to plug that if, if it's in your mindset or for whatever reason you, you feel like, OK, I, I just I want to go to the bachelor's and then stop there and assess, there, you can still get and do work, right? And, and, and the education in psychology is beneficial truly in every, every field you could possibly enter. And even just in a, on a personal level, I think it's incredibly beneficial to be educated about psychology. But I wanted to plug um, our counseling program here at Gavilan. I know that Simone is somewhere here. There's, there's one of our counselors, Simone. Um, so I just encourage you that it, it, do a lot of career exploration. Ask all the questions you have. Have a clear sense of what doors will open for you upon completing your bachelor's degree and whether that's enough or whether you want other doors to open for you. So I just wanted to kind of plug that and, and you know, acknowledge that. But again, the, the question now is exactly which degrees have you earned and any details you want to share around that. And then the second part is basically what lifestyle has this profession afforded you? Maybe give people a sense of the general range that people can expect to make if they were to enter your line of work. You don't have to, talk, you don't have to submit your W-2s right now or anything like that, but just give people some general sense of what that might look like and then, and then how, much, how demanding it is emotionally, how demanding it is on your time those types of details. So degrees and lifestyle afforded by your profession. Maybe we'll just start it with Josh. <laughs> sure. Um, let's see. So, so my academic journey, um, I think I've shared this once before with another group, but I actually came here for cosmetology <laughs> when I first started, right? Like, and, and I really had no clue what I was doing. I kind of just like, knew where the room was, and it wasn't where it is now, but it's somewhere else, but it was like in the portables. And I went to the portables and I like just went in there and like sat down and uh, they were like, Josh, you need to register and like sign up for classes, you know, like we can see if there's room, but I think we're full. And I was like, oh, okay, that's how it works. And uh, although I was a good student prior, I just, my, my parents didn't really go to college. My brother didn't go to college. So I just had to kind of figure out on my own. Um, and so being kind of an indecisive person at the beginning, I was like, well, I guess I'll go abroad and go communications because that's like everywhere, right? And so I finished my A in communications here um, with a lot of the professors that you guys might even have. Um, and then uh, I got my BA in communication studies at San Jose State and uh, really enjoyed my time there. And uh, then after I took a long break, um, until, like I said, later on, I went back to get my master's in social work. Um, now, I almost, I love psychology. Maybe, I mean, not to like, I know we have different opinions, but, and I know I'm from social work, but I feel like psychology, like being an MFT, might have been 
where I would have wanted to go to learn certain things. Um, I'm not so much, I don't really do any social activism stuff. I mean, I have ideas, but I don't really go and do stuff, right? Um, and so, but I do love people. And so, um, so education-wise, I felt like it would have been interesting to see what an MFT program would have had to offer or even gone for my PhD, you know, instead of getting my master's, right? Because that could have been a nice, you know, that could have been something different too and been a psychologist. Um, but anyways, um, affordability-wise, um, I didn't have to take on any debt. I was really good at saving. Like I said, I had kind of a gap, right? Like I had quite a, quite a bit of time where I was just able to like save up money. And so I was able to afford um, my MSW program without taking on debt. Um, and yeah, what was the next part of the question? I the oh, the lifestyle. Um, I think going into Social work, there's a huge range, right? I think if you're working for nonprofit agencies, it's a little bit lower as far as salary goes. Um, I think if you go into individual and private pay and you're really good at marketing, um, like you can get, I think you can pay quite a bit more, but it's an ethic thing. I, I don't know. I've seen some therapists that charge ridiculous amounts. Like people normally charge more for couples therapy, um, but some of the rates that I saw, I was like, dang, like that, I would just feel like evil, right? If I did that, if I charged that much, right? Um, and so for me, it's an ethics thing and I think there's a balance, but um, I don't know. I'm trying to give you guys a fair range of like, it, cause it can go up, you know, really, like I said, how much you're depending, but I think low end 50, high end, or realistically, I think 120, I think would be pretty feasible, but, um, but I still think it's not, like I said, there's so much diversity in this field that you could do something totally different and you can work for a place that's well-funded and things like that. And so there's, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I'm not really, um, I don't really care that much about money. So like the lifestyle that's afforded me to live is more time, right? If I want more time for myself, I could do that, which is really nice, right? I don't have to take on that many clients. I can take on less, right? Um, and that to me is really important because relationships are really important. And I would hate to neglect my own personal relationships to do more work, right? And so um, that's kind of where I'm at with it. I think if you want to earn a lot of money, you can work. I have a friend that sees like 50 clients a week and I'm like, whoa, how do you even do that? Um, but they are really, money's important to them. So they, they work for it. And so, yeah, so I think I probably answered it. All right, money. <laughs> well, my, as far as my education goes, I feel like the most um, impactful educational time of my life was when I dropped out of high school. So that's where I started, and I was just very practical. I wanted to work. I worked in restaurants, and um, I enjoyed that quite a bit. And then um, one day, my mentor told me, you're not done learning. You know, go back to community college. So that is what I did. I went um, and took a couple courses at a community college up in Humboldt County, and it was amazing. And it was the first time in my life I ever actually realized I like school, I'm good at school. I thought I just, school wasn't for me. So that was hugely impactful for me to kind of re-identify as a really strong learner that I always had been and that I was able to support myself moving forward in that direction. Um, so I went to a community college, I got a few AAs there and then moved on to getting my uh, bachelor's degree at Humboldt State University, which is now Humboldt Cal Poly. Whoop, whoop and um, really enjoyed that. I studied music as well, which is just for me, a huge part of my journey is balance, is, you know, I would say I would go down to the psychology classes and, and interact and learn and, and stress my brain, and then I went up to the music classes over there to like, ah, have that balance and make connection with people. So that's something I've tried to kind of take with me in my career as I've pivoted, as I've done different things, is looking at my overall work-life balance and how am I gonna make that work? Because it's not always easy to do. Um, so I did, as I said before, I worked for a nonprofit mental health organization. It was called Alliance 
for community care. Now it's called Momentum. There were so many opportunities there. So here's where you can do something with a bachelor's degree. I mean, there's some positions even not with a bachelor's degree, but to start off in a counseling position that you get to be supervised by um, psychologists, psychiatrists, LMFTs, social workers. So you're working with all this broad spectrum of professionals, which was a wonderful way to get in and see what people do and if I wanted to do what they were doing and to learn from them. So that was a rich, rich opportunity for me um, while there where I worked, which was for their adolescent residential facility, it lost its funding and we got one week's notice. And so we ended up with an entire facility of traumatized youth who already were traumatized and had to deal with being relocated and then us losing our jobs. And that was huge and pivotal because of seeing how it could just all fall away for these kids who we were supposed to be their stability. This is, you know, so that was really heartbreaking and it ended up being an opportunity because I was very rigid. I only wanted to work with teens and youth. Um, that was it, you know, and I could be a little like fixed on that. I'm like, I get it. I dropped out of high school. These are my people. And then I decided to take another opportunity. I was picked up by another program manager to work with adults. And these were adults coming off of psychiatric holds. So they were either had, had a psychotic break or a suicide attempt or um, were feeling suicidal. And so they came to us for a stabilization. And that was one of the greatest things. I'm so happy I did that because I was scared to work with adults. I'm like, I don't think I felt old enough to work with adults or something. And so I was really intimidated. And then as we're talking about at the time, access one diagnoses, schizophrenia and, and psychotic episodes, different things like that. I, it, was, it was a leap for me. I didn't. I was outside of my comfort zone, and it was just one of the best things I ever did, um, working closely with that population, and they taught me so much um, uh, about life. And so from there, I was kind of ready to kind of move on and um, decided to, that was a time where my family decided to have a change, live in a country other than the United States, and we picked Mexico. And that's where I had the opportunity to be a school counselor. And as I said before, um, for me, working with youth in their habitat is awesome. I love it so much. And so that's when I decided to go back, get my master's degree, get my PPS credential. I also did the coursework for LPCC counseling and ended up not completing my hours with that because of moving into education which is where I am now. So I'm working for a school district and what I am doing is, I just love this gig so much. Pay, eh, it's just honestly not that great. <laughs> it starts like lower 50s for um, a social emotional counselor um, and that's for PBUSD school district. I don't know if I'm exactly right on. I didn't check what it currently is, what the start is. Goes up to 90s. Um, there's other similar jobs in Santa Clara County and around that that I could move on to that are similar that would be $30,000 more than I'm pay, getting paid now. Um, a thing to think about, especially if you have a family and are looking at insurance and, and benefits, my benefits for where I'm at are really good. They're some of the best benefits around. And when I initially moved into that position, it saved our family $30,000 by getting those benefits. So it's lower pay, better benefits, and they're actually working on getting some of the pay um, improvement there. But the other thing I would just really point out for education for those who, who haven't thought about it is it is a really good gig. Um, you're there, you're working with the kids. This is where things are happening. This is where we can identify um, at-risk youth and we can be early intervention and prevention. We're on the ground, we're able to do that. It's very exciting work. Um, at PBUSD, we are K-12 with our social emotional learning program. And it's essential that we have those K-12 programs, that we keep them strong. And we, right now we have a lot of support, which is wonderful. Hopefully we'll keep that support. But I will tell you, for me personally, as far as um, the school 
time frame and your schedule, it's a pretty good deal. You make a little bit less because you're probably a 11 month employee. You get that spread out. So that works out. But um, I actually, both my partner and I are in education. And that has been super cool because um, we have two children. So we have all had the same schedule. We have winter breaks together. We have summers together. We, we have spring break together. And I know that that's I, something I'm very, very grateful for. It's really impacted my life in a beautiful way um, to be able to have that work-life balance where I'm at work and I'm working hard. I work primarily in um, suicide risk prevention awareness and suicide risk prevention, and meaning I do risk assessments. Um, we have students who are at risk of suicide or also we do threat assessments. If we're concerned somebody might be upset with someone enough to wanna hurt them, we, we work with those students. So a lot of um, what those of us who tend to be doing this kind of work in the schools right now, it is intense. It's, it's heavy, <laughs> you know, it's real life, and it's joyful because these are kids and they're growing and they're learning who they want to be, and you get to be a part of that too, which is why I like being in schools. You kind of get both of the sides of the student and see who they really are all the way around, and it's a joy. Um, I have a wellness center I operate, so I um, there's a wellness center that all of our students can come to, and... I don't have enough time to go into how that actually works, but it's it's exciting times that our schools are creating wellness centers now, um, and our district is trying to have them in every single school now, which is incredible. So, but that's just a couple of plugs for edu you know working in education. There are a lot of perks to that. There's a lot of bureaucracy and other things that I won't say that those are the perks, uh, but I'll just leave it there. <laughs> right. Okay, um, I'm trying to think. So when I was 12, I was like, I wanted to be a child life specialist um, because I had a brother who passed away from leukemia and I had a child life specialist. So I was like, she's really cool and I want to be like her. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what did you go to school for my senior year? I was like, what did you go to school for? Or whenever we were filling out college applications and she was like, well, you can do biology or psychology. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing bio. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't really like that much science. I don't want to do that. So I decided, okay, I'm going to major in psychology. And I came from a lower middle class. Um, and so I really wanted to go to school with people who looked like me. Um, so I grew up here in Gilroy. Um, I was typically one of the only African-American students in my class. And I was like, I want to go to school with people who look like me. So I chose a school out of state. And I went to an historical black college. And it was the best three years of my life, but it was expensive. Um, there's not a lot of financial aid. There's not a lot of help. And like I said, I was from a lower middle class, so my parents didn't have money. <laughs> so quickly I figured out I was going to have to come home. And that was like the biggest blow to my ego, like, dang, now I have to like come home and start over. Um, so I came to Gav and I was like, I don't know. I, I don't think I was as motivated um, when I came to Gav. I did a semester and I just kind of felt like, a little hopeless. I won't say, I'll say I felt very hopeless. Like I'll never get my degree. Like I will never graduate. I'll never do what I want to do. Like this is going to take me forever. So I worked retail and then I ended up getting a job at a bank and I was like, okay, so I'm making better money. Like, okay, so maybe I can go to school. So I went to San Jose city and I did the early childhood education courses, and I got my AA in EC, and my sister-in-law told me about a program at Notre Dame Dean Amir um, up in Belmont, and she at the time was a business major, but it was an evening program. And I was like, in the evening? Like, I could go to school at night, because I was like, there's no way I cannot work and go to school, like that just wasn't an option for me. I had to work. So I looked and they had an evening psychology program and I was like, okay, like I can do this. So I applied 
I got in and I worked full time and I went to school in the evening time. Um, I did take out some loans and I was like, it's okay. Like I see, like, I see the light, like I see the light, like I can do this. So I graduated from Notre Dame Dean Amir with my bachelor's 10 years after I graduated high school. Well, nine years, nine years. And I was like, you know what? Everybody else I knew graduated, but it's okay. Like I still did it. Like I made it. And then when it came to thinking about, I was like, I know I need to get my master's. I want to be a therapist. Like, what am I going to do? So I had a professor who was like, why don't you just come back to Notre Dame? And I was like, but I just got my bachelor's here. Like, I want to do something different. And I met with the counselor at San Jose State who told me that they accept five students a year for their master's program. And I said, five? I said, five students? She was like, five. And I said, and what's the application fee? And she was like, $100. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> so you accept five students, and all these people pay you $100? Do I get it back? And she was like, no. And I said, oh, no, no, mm -mm. nope, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, as somebody who worked to pay to go to school, I was like, hundred. I'm paying you $100, and I have a, my chance of getting in is like, negative one like I'm like I don't get it I'm not gonna get in even if I was a straight-A student the probability of me getting in was not very high so I said okay and at the time I had switched careers I was working with kids on the autism spectrum and I thought about just getting my master's and becoming a BCBA a broad certified behavioral analyst because I really liked it and I was quickly starting to get burnt out I mean it, there's a lot that goes into working as a BT. Like you get hit, you get spin on, you get peen on. It was just very taxing. And I was like, I don't think I want, I don't think I want to do that. Um, so I applied for the clinical psychology department at Notre Dame and I got it. And I remember looking at the counselor and I'm like, what is the damage gonna be for this? Like, what is this gonna cost me? And she was like, well, it's about like 45, 50,000. And I was like, I just was like, this is, this can't be. Like, all I'm doing is accruing more debt to go to school to do what I really want to do. So I went home and I still lived with my parents because we live in Santa Clara County. Rent is high. <laughs> I'm going to school. I'm trying to work. And I'm like, what do I do? And I remember my dad looked at me and he said, you know, the harder you work, the more you'll appreciate it. And I said, huh? And he was like, you appreciate your degree a lot more because you worked for it. And I was like, hmm. He's like, I, your mom and I worked so hard to buy this one house and this was all of our money to buy this house. And he's like, I appreciate it every day every day I do something around here because I appreciate this one thing. And I was like, okay, so I can do this. So I went and I emailed the lady and I said, okay, sign, <laughs> sign me up, like I can do this. And I took out another loan and I got my master's at Notre Dame. Um, it was such a great experience. Um, the professors there were amazing. Um, my last year there, I actually paid for it in cash, so I did not take another loan. I had, I was working at a school and I saved as much as I could and I paid for it in cash and I felt so happy um, that I was able to do that. I will say that my degree, um, degrees I should say, afforded me the opportunity. I think what I value most now is the flexibility and the time. Um, I'm newly married, and so I it affords me the opportunity to spend time with my husband um, and to do things. Um, I make my own schedule, and if I want to work out at 9 o'clock in the morning, I just don't schedule myself at 9 o'clock. Like, if I need to take a vacation, I just schedule myself not to work like 
I can rearrange. I think for me, it's not so much the money aspect. It's more the flexibility that I get. I mean, I do community-based and I also have a private practice. Um, and combined, um, it's nice. I've been able to pay off a lot of my loans. I also work community-based, so there's that, you know, student loan forgiveness. So I chose, I chose that avenue for a reason. I'm like, I need some student loan forgiveness. But um, I would say community-based and nonprofits, you're looking at low end right now. They just bumped it up. I think it's like 65, 66, um, high end, depending on your position, your license, years of standing. You're looking more in like that 90-ish range. Um, but the benefits are great. You know, my husband works in tech and his benefits are horrible. If I were to be on his health insurance, we'd be paying. Mine, we're not really paying much. Um, so I think that's also, you know, looking at what are the benefits. Maybe the pay is not as, as good as you want it to be, but your health benefits are better. Your 401k package is better. Um, your paid time off is better. Um, so I think just looking at all of those things at a whole, but just know that like if you're somebody who was like me and you're trying to work really hard and to go to school, like it's not impossible and you can do it. And there are programs out there that will help you. Um, I was really lucky and really blessed to find an evening program so I didn't have to quit my job. Um, even when I did my practicum, I um, did it at Discovery Counseling Center in Morgan Hill. They were really flexible with my schedule. I was like, Look, I have class and I have to work. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things. Like, this is number three. Like, I need my hours, but I have to go to work every day and I have to go to class. And so they were very flexible. So I think that's what I like about this field and the education I chose and the avenues I chose. It was very flexible and they were always willing to work with me. So. I like money. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Um, I'm what they call, a, I don't know if you've, they use this term anymore, I'm what you call a ready-made father. So 40-something years ago, I found the love of my life by accident. I was at a prayer group, and there was this gorgeous, beaming woman who didn't want anything to do with me. You know how it goes, right? And she had three kids Three kids. I'm 20. Three kids from a previous marriage, but that didn't matter. I knew we were supposed to be together. And I was just starting De Anza College. Took dance, some music, and a psychology course. And the first epiphany I had about, hmm, something in psychology was an amazing, motivating, inspiring professor at De Anza. And I saw the universe through different lenses for the first time ever, rather than running with my peers who tend to see the universe through a very singular lens and everybody agrees with each other because that's the best way to be diverse and different is to agree with each other. And this professor taught critical thinking skills and, uh, in, and a bunch of different psychology courses. It was just eye-opening. And so, uh, so 10 years of school after high school, four years for your bachelor's, two years for your master's, two years for your doctorate, and another two years in, in, in um, an internship program to get your clinical feet wet, right? So I'm juggling uh, 10 years of concentration and a family of four to support at 20. Hmm. So I raced over and got a job at uh, Straw Hat Pizza, something, bring something in, and drove a truck. Um, from De Anza, I went to an advanced standing at uh, UCSC when it only had, I think it was eight colleges back then, uh, but one of the most beautiful campuses in the world. I did my graduate work in Plainfield, Vermont. I was there long enough to know I don't do snow. <laughs> <laughs> when it, I have a very narrow bandwidth of acceptable thermal temperatures from <laughs> mid-60s to mid-70s. Anything below or over, I'm complaining. So I live in Santa Cruz, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, 10 years and then two years of internship. Um, 
couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, was it worth it? Absolutely. Because like I said earlier, uh, if, if you want to pivot in variety of arenas, different arenas within the vast general area of psychology, you're able to do that. And I'm the type of guy I like options. I don't want to be stuck in one boring thing for 40 years. I liked options. I wanted to move over here. I wanted to try this out. I wanted to move completely out of direct services and th psychotherapy into administrative and policy making. Then I wanted to pivot over to education. I've done research and publications, just a whole spectrum thing that I knew I could best do by going the whole nine yards. And I knew if I didn't do it when I'm in my 20s, it was never going to happen because life happens, you know? The older your kids get, the more expensive they are. You know that. I mean, your parents know that. All of a sudden, my teenagers want Levi jeans that I used to get for a couple of bucks in the back of, of uh, Sears. Now they're chained to these tables, and you have to go get a sales clerk to unlock this <laughs> pair of jeans for 150 bucks. What? No, you're going to Marshall's or Ross. <laughs> hey, there's some good stuff there. Uh, but anyway, was it worth it? It was absolutely worth it because I knew if I was going to do something for 40 or so years, I had to enjoy it. Um, and I had to make enough money to uh, support my lifestyle, which is not extravagant. I go to a movie, my wife and I go to a movie and out to a restaurant, modest, uh, once in a while, and that's about it. Uh, we're avid subscribers to Prime and um, uh, um, Netflix, and that's, you know, a sort of big screen TV, but... But um, um, now I have grandkids. That's another thing. I told my kids, I was practicing on you guys. I got it now. So I'll take over the grandkids if you get confused. Because <laughs> I know it's your first attempt. And I've been there. Um, uh, no, but what I'm trying to say is that it was definitely worth it. It was a lot of money, but I always thought that I was worth the investment. And I would get it back if I did a trajectory over the next 10, 20 years. Um, and which, which happened. But I found that an inspiring professor helps to focus your interest somewhere in psychology where's a starting point to a great mentor. So if you take an entry level position somewhere with an AA or a, B, like a BA position, that's not where you're gonna be in your career. It's a starting point. Find your starting point. And once you've engaged in whatever clinic or program you went to as your starting point, then you're going to get to know people, and you'll find somebody that invariably that's, that you, you vibe with more than the others. And it might be a licensed clinician. It may be an administrator. maybe a psychiatrist. And, you, and they can be your mentor. And usually they're really um, um, uh, um, okay with mentoring you about what's a reasonable next step. What field of psychology do I want to go into? Do I want to be an LCSW, an LMF, is it MFT or LMFCC? MFT. M-O-U-S-E. Yeah. <laughs> PhD, you want to go to medical school, nursing, you know. LPC. 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 Right, yes, that's right. I'm a double. <laughs> uh, and so a, an inspiring, motivating professor, a good mentor once you're in a starting uh, point at an entry-level job at some behavioral health agency, and, and just little bits at a time, put in for, one foot in front of you like, like I did, and I wasn't, I'm not anyone special or partic particularly bright, but I, I trusted the advice of my mentors and professors to go the next step and to, and to look around that arena and to ask more questions and then take the next step incrementally. And that was very helpful. And yeah, I agree. Entry level with the bachelor's is between 60, you know, 50, 60,000 a year. That's a starting point. And there's a lot of other jobs. Their starting points are you know, well below that. And then the high end, um, and I'm going to tell you one of my biases, best kept secret in town, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it, high end is 120, 150,000, which is not, by the way, it's not much in our area. Don't look like 150,000, wow. Mm -hmm. If you do wage adjustment, that's about 70,000 a year, so. Um, but uh, I, I, I was informed by my mentor, I trusted a, uh, with my life, starting a nonprofit, community-based nonprofit. It was a residential drug treatment facility. And no one knew about recovery. They all, they all referred you to self-help. And I quickly discovered that self-help, as good as that is, is not treatment. What are we doing for treatment for compulsive use? 
Um, and so uh, that was a, an encouraging question. And from there, it just kind of skyrocketed. Um, the best kept secret in town is that community-based organizations are awesome. You will cut your teeth. You'll learn from some of the best and the brightest, licensed, non-licensed, certified. These are amazing people who are so full of heart and dedicated to the clients they serve. That being said, the best part of my lengthy career was when I worked for public services and public service, uh, local government, city, county, state. Amazing, and I loved community-based services, uh, but public public service was probably the highlight of my career because the range of diversity in your in the in the huge employee base, the, and particularly in Santa Clara County, we had every aspect of the healthcare industry right there. So it, it brought a whole new dimension to case management. I mean, we could refer internally. If our clients had never seen a primary care doc in 20 years, we knew how to refer them to, to get free uh, um, physical exam. I mean, wow, right? Psychiatry, uh, medications, uh, specialty in suicide prevention, uh, child adolescent health, whatever. This huge realm, which they call a health and hospital system, it was, it was amazing the breadth and scope of, of brilliant services that are I don't know, 30,000 employee base uh, offered the community. It was just, it was just a, to be a part of that was just a blessing and an honor. That was a highlight of my career. And then uh, from there, you know, like I said, you just do little bits of things to put icing on the cake. But I'm telling you, it's an inspiring, motivating professor, a starting point in entry level and community-based organization, and finding a mentor who's very, uh, um, uh, a veteran in providing services whom you trust and, and, and get along with really well, and just take it step at a time. And um, if you have an inkling that helping profession is what you might want to do, that's the road to where you get to, where you get, you don't, I've never met, met, ever met anybody who had a crystal clear map of how they wanted to go from point A to point B. No, you, you, you try stuff, you take a step, and you try stuff, that's ah, not for me, I, I tried that. I tried that adolescent counseling, they drove me to drink. <laughs> but it's not, you know, it's not them, it's me, it's my limitation. But give me a dope fiend and I'm there, I'm, I'm there, I'm, I'm with you. Their, their reference, not mine. Um, but that, that's all I have to say and it, it was well worth it. More, definitely worth the investment in the, in the career options. And you won't be sorry. Okay, so to frame my education path, I have to tell you where I come from. So I am the daughter of immigrant parents from Mexico with no high school education. And I, if you're familiar with San Jose, I grew up on the east side of San Jose. So interesting community to grow up in. Love the east side. Still, parents are still on the east side. That's still, that's still my hood. But all I ever wanted to do was get out, right? I really wanted to go to college, the college that I saw on TV and make my parents proud. So this is what I thought. Go to high school graduate high school, right? I had to be the first in my family to graduate high school. My brother did continuation school. He says he has his, uh, degree, uh, his diploma, I haven't seen it, so I still tell him <laughs> that I don't think he graduated. He's also 11 years older, so there was this huge age gap. And I thought, all right, I gotta graduate high school, and then I gotta get into a four-year university. I gotta graduate with a bachelor's, and I gotta get paid. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a psychologist, right? I'm gonna get my psychology degree, I'm gonna, that, that'll come up. So. Definitely graduated high school, had a solid GPA, had solid extracurriculars, you know, all the, the fun stuff they tell you needs to go on that app to make you, you know, competitive to get into university. Applied to four-year colleges or universities, got into a couple. All right, you know, was finally going to leave the east side. I was going to go down to San Diego, go to those college parties, live in a dorm, <laughs> have the time of my life, you know, whatever I saw on the Disney Channel or whatever we was, I was watching back in the day. <laughs> fun times. So, so, uh, well... That was cool, I, I, I was gonna go. And then I realized, oh yeah, I'm from a Mexican family. I am the youngest. I uh, have a really old school dad who was not okay with me going down to San Diego. He wondered why I didn't apply to San Jose State, just down the street. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't wanna stay home. I don't know how you communicate to your parents that all you wanna do is leave all you've known and create your own life and explore and learn something new. I see some of you shaking your head. You know, I just wanted to get out. So 
I didn't. And I had to scramble because, as you know, when you have to register for a community college, seats fill up. And I was late to the game. So I ended up enrolling at Evergreen. Didn't get into many classes because they were already jam-packed. Did my time at Evergreen, did three years at Evergreen, um, ended up saying that I was going to be a public relations major. Hmm. I have no idea to this day what, what that means. I, didn't, I did not know then either, but I circled that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, sounds cool. Let's, let's do this, Jasmine, right? <laughs> and then I'm taking some classes, and I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I was, I was pretty, had good grades in high school. I, I, I was bright. I will say that, you know, I, I knew that that was my way out. So then I started taking psych classes, developmental psych. Started learning about all these psychologists, attachment theory, all of these concepts. And I thought, I just never heard about this. This sounds amazing. So I'm at Evergreen and I realized I might as well get my AA. I'm going to be here for a couple of years. So declared as a psych major, got my AA and I'm in the transfer, transfer world now, right? So guess what? You want to transfer? I wanted to leave again because I was still on the east side living with my parents and I'm, I'm applying and I'm getting into these, these transfer, you know, for your universities. I'm like, oh, I can feel it. The college life, it's, it's, it's coming, right? It's coming. So got rejected from my dream school. Still have beef with UCLA. It's, it's fine. If any of you apply and, and get in, let me know. I will cheer you on. But um, because I wanted to leave. I wanted to go down south. I wanted to get out of the Bay Area. Ended up getting into Berkeley. Is all right. <laughs> right? So yeah. it, it's, it's a cool, you know, it's a cool spot to land. But ended up going to Berkeley. Uh, that didn't still sit well with dad because San Jose State's right down the road. Right? So he's still wondering why I didn't apply to San Jose State. And <laughs> this, this will be a theme. Uh, just so you know, spoiler alert, I never ended up going to state. Shout out to state. Um, but I just did not end up going because I wanted to leave. So ended up going to Berkeley. Got my bachelor's in psych, and let me tell you, it was very isolating. It was difficult. Remember, I'm a first-gen student. My parents can help me after probably middle school with stuff. Um, still living at home, I commuted to Berkeley every day. I took BART, night classes, day classes, drove, hustled. Like, it was just back and forth, and is exhausting. And if you've ever been on BART, it's, it, it's interesting. And you're on BART at night sometimes, and you're studying, and you're exhausted, and you're falling asleep. and I, I did that, right? And I, I look back and I say, I, I did that. And it was, it was tough. But ultimately graduated, got my bachelor's. Parents were super proud. But uh, a bachelor's in psychology, I thought I was going to be a psychologist walking, walking that stage. <laughs> like, I got a bachelor's. I'm good. I can go practice. Naive, right? And really had to figure this out all on my own in terms of what comes next. So traveled for a couple of weeks and then thought, all right, I need to, I need to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> Didn't figure it out, but I ended up doing community volunteer work on the east side. So working local communities, working with um, predominantly Hispanic communities, um, youth, pa families, parents that wanted resources, and I became kind of a counselor. They were confiding me, talking to me about the issues they were experiencing behind closed doors, just really transparent. And I thought to myself, what can I do with, with kids? Hit up Google, work with kids with a psychology degree, bachelor's. No joke, that's what I Googled. And I had to do this just random research on my own because I really didn't build those connections. And I was doing this very alone. And it was isolating, as I mentioned. So I just advise you kind of just side note to make the connections, pick people's brains, ask questions, because that will help you as you try to navigate. And I really failed in doing that. So I was really, really, really isolated as I was trying to navigate what to do next. So then I decide, all right, I'm going to go get a master's degree. That's what, I, that's what I have to do. I think it just makes sense, right? So what does that even mean? Oh, I got to take an exam? What, what the heck's a GRE? <laughs> I'm horrible at test taking. PSATs, SATs, ACTs, I think they've gotten rid of those now. Hopefully they have. I, I was just never a good test taker. I could be a bookworm, and I could do great presentations and do, do great writing and all that stuff, but I could never test well. So I thought, what, what are, what's my actual shot at getting into a graduate program? So took the GRE twice. Eh, I don't even remember the scores then applied to graduate programs for school counseling. That's what I had chosen to, to study. So finally, I was leading the Bay Area. I got into two schools up in Washington State, and I thought, all right, I'm, I'm leaving. So I get into the master's program. I complete my master's degree, do school counseling, internship, and it is a ride. I did K-8, 
my jam is middle schoolers. I, I love that age. And if y'all remember being in middle school, we were not a fun time. None of us were a fun time in middle school. If you, if you have middle schoolers, if you raise middle schoolers, if you have nieces and nephews, ooh, ooh, that's, that's, that's it. So, but the littles were tough too. So I work with the kindergartner whose both of his parents were incarcerated and they were in and out of jail and he was constantly acting up in the classroom. I had my share of CPS reports. I had the bullying. I had the teen pregnancies. I saw it all. And it was a different experience for me. And I love Washington. I love the snow and I love the cold. But uh, Jasmine that wanted to leave the Bay, she came back. You know, my parents were getting older and I thought, you know, I've, I'm gonna stay out here. There were wonderful opportunities after, after my graduate program and staying out there. And I thought, um, from a Mexican family, and if any of you are Mexican or just your own culture, it's, I, I wanted to be closer to my family. And I came home and really thought about, you know, what can I do here? And if you are considering, you know, transferring or getting higher education degrees and wanting to move states or countries, I do advise that you look into what it's gonna take to come home if you ever want to come back home. Transferring credentials, or if you can even transfer your license or whatever you get somewhere else, because it'll, it'll be a pain. So when I was coming back home, surprise Jasmine, you need to take another test. <laughs> so there I was studying for some, I don't know, to get my PPS, what is it, the, the, C, the CTC, the, there's, a, there's a teacher test. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> And here I go again, studying for a test on my own, trying to figure out how do I even transfer my credentials? Well, in doing that, I missed the window for um, applying for jobs because it's summer and that's where a lot of the counseling or May through June, July, if you're lucky, there are some counseling jobs that open. So missed the window, did apply for a couple, but it just didn't work out. And then I, as I mentioned earlier, I ended up landing at Stanford which wasn't a bad place to land either. And it started my career in suicide prevention. So it all worked out, hmm. but a lot of wanting to leave and come home and explore and all of that. I, I encourage you all to look outside of the state or outside of Santa Clara County. There are wonderful programs everywhere. And I think that I wouldn't trade the ups and downs, the those long nights on BART, but it, it definitely made me value the fact that whatever timeline or preconceived notion of what I thought it meant that I had to get my four-year degree right after high school. You don't have to. Some of us can't. Some people need to work. Some, some people just can't go to school full-time, and that's okay as well. So whatever you think people think you need to do, do it on your own timeline. Don't rush it and take it at your own pace. And the financial side of things. So um, um, I work for the government, so Santa Clara County is a government entity. Our salaries are public. You can Google what if you're looking at thinking about a position in, in a government. You can a government, uh, whether it's local, county, state, federal. You can see what people make. It's public knowledge. But ultimately, what I will say is that thinking about health benefits and retirement and benefits. As someone with pre-existing health condition. Mm -hmm. I didn't have benefits for a while, and that came back to really haunt me, and I didn't go to the doctor, and then you're going to the doctor, and you have certain situations that you find yourself in because you weren't seeing a medical professional for a while. So considering all of that, you know, yeah, you want to make a good living, especially if you want to live in Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County, 150 isn't going to cut it. But ultimately, think about taxes and think about what gets taken out with your pension and retirement. So... You know, sometimes the side hustles as, you know, I have a lot of friends that do work for county that have other jobs that they do. So private practice, all of that. Mm -hmm. But it's really what you start off with and just explore and other licensures, other, uh, other credentials that you can get. Um, but we were laughing about the Marshalls thing because I'm like, uh, I can afford to get shoes and we love shopping at Marshalls. So, I mean, it, the lifestyle is pretty good. <laughs> so I, it's a paycheck. And I think it's a paycheck doing something that I had no idea I wanted to do. So just keep your options open. And, and my, my career path really, or my education path really stemmed from my upbringing and my roots, but really became my own because I realized as much as I was doing it for my family, I was doing it for me. And they were going to be happy regardless of what I did. Sorry, Dad, for not going to state, but I think I think he's over it by now. <laughs> I think. Can I just jump in really quick? I want to make sure, Nicole, you have plenty of breathing room. So I, I, I think what we'll do is 
skip the part where you ask the whole panel questions, and we'll just go right to the part where you approach individual panelists, because I, I don't want to cut anything short right now. I want you to have plenty of breathing room. And just while I'm thinking about it, as a couple people talked about loans, I also took out loans in my graduate school. In making that decision, you have to know about income-based repayment, so IBR, look that up, P-A-Y-E, pay as you earn, and PSLF, Public Service Loan Forgiveness. So I'll save my time to talk to you another time since I'm here and accessible to you, but I would love to share with you like, what percentage of my loan I'm actually going to end up paying back, given that I've worked for a, a nonprofit organization, which is a community college. So I just wanted to plug that since, since the loan topic has come up. A couple people raised their hands real quick, yeah. Absolutely. IBR, which is income-based repayment, and that means you pay your loan back according to your income. So it's a percentage of your income. Or similarly, it's pay as you earn, so P-A-Y-E. And then the other one is public service loan forgiveness, which in short means that if you're on an IBR plan and you don't miss a payment for 10 years straight and you work full-time for a public service organization, your loan is completely forgiven. So like I said, just in, in calculating whether, that, whether to take a loan, you have to know about those repayment options. So just want to say that real quick. Yeah, Sapphire. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of DORs, like kind of thing where I, for disabled students and also people who um, are recovering addicts and who else are like, who have gone through trauma and have their, um, whether it be a therapist know, whether it be a psychiatrist know, um, I personally know that I have disabilities and I've had my entire school paid for. Mm. I've had my tuition paid for, I've had my books paid for, I've had my school supplies paid for, I've had my classes paid for by DOR. My entire education has been paid for by DOR. If you have disabilities, they will pay every single penny except for your housing. And I know that 90% of people I come across don't know about this. Thank you for mentioning it. So what exactly should people Google? <laughs> DOR, Department of Rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So like I said, plenty of space for you to share as thoroughly as you want, and then we'll have a good 20 minutes or so for you to approach the panelists and get more food and all that. So please, Nicole, share. Yeah, I need, a, I need one of those macaroons out there. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll also share um, how everyone else has about a little bit about history and why I came to the work I came to. Um, I was also raised, I was, I was um, born in Pennsylvania, but raised in Cleveland, Ohio. And so I'm used to the snow, never going back. Um, <laughs> I get asked that all the time and I'm never, ever going back. Somehow every time I go back, it's like the worst snowstorm ever. Um, I think it's just a reminder of what I, you know. Um, but I grew up in Cleveland. I w my family was one of the only families of color for a long time, I think till eighth grade. And I finally saw another kid of color. And of course, everyone assumed we were related, <laughs> which happened all the time, which I think is hilarious. Every kid of color that came in, that's your cousin, right? No, still not. Um, and I had phenomenal K-12 teachers who really fed into me and saw my gifts um, and, and allowed me to grow. Um, I have no complaints other than my fifth grade teacher who was clearly racist and didn't think I was smart and wanted me to get tested for special ed. So I get to, get, did, did get tested and I tested gifted. So, um, yeah, she told my mom she didn't think black kids learn the same way as white kids and that I should be tested for SPED. So, um, and that's not a, a dig on special ed at all, but um, that was just a, a dig on her. Um, but I also grew up with parents who did, um, they graduated high school and both went into the military. My dad was Navy, my mom went into the Army. Uh, so they didn't go to college. They both earned their college degrees after I earned mine. Um, so I was one of the first in my family. My older sister went to college um, undergrad but didn't continue on to grad school. So I was the first in my, in my family to get a graduate degree. Um, and then my mom and dad got theirs afterwards. Um, but my parents were very much like, you will go to college. That was not an option for me. Um, we often had to shop at Goodwill, and my mom would always buy, do you, I, I'm going to age myself, but there was puffy paint back in the 80s. So you could, like, you know, paint something, on, and then you iron it, and it puffs a little bit. So my mom somehow would always go and find, like, the Harvard and the Yale and the Stanford sweatshirts. So 
we always had like college pins and he, like it was avid kind of for um, for those of you who under, are familiar with that. But it was a constant like you will go to college, you will go to college, you will go to college. Um, I also had a mother who um, was <laughs> very anytime I said any my sisters and I, I'm, I'm the middle of three girls. Anytime one of us said we wanted to do something or we were interested in doing something, my mom would go full on into that. And, you know, my sister wanted to be a vet. OK, you're going to volunteer at the Humane Society and we're going to go take our neighbor's dog for a walk. And then we're. I, um, when I was eight, wanted to be a pediatrician um, because I wanted to help people. My mom went to Goodwill and found a Gray's Anatomy, the actual <laughs> Gray's Anatomy that's this thick. So at eight, in eight, eight years old, I'm reading through Gray's Anatomy. Um, I got an Invisible Woman doll, if you've ever seen those, where you put the organs in, in together. But I also then, once I, was, um, once I turned 13, I was able to volunteer in hospitals. So I became a candy striper. Um, and I got to do patient transportation which was sometimes taking live patients out and sometimes taking dead patients to the morgue. <laughs> um, and then once I became, once I was 16, I was actually able to work with patients. So I was able to do um, child, child, um, child life. And that's when I realized there, was child, there were child life specialists. Um, so those of you who don't know, child life specialists work in hospitals and they are the ones who help support young people as they're going through their illness, but they also support the other kids in the family. Um, so we would go around and do puppet shows for the kids in the in the oncology ward, or um, uh, we had an in-house TV show that we would do for them. We would take around library books or puzzles and things like that. Um, and that was really eye-opening because I was the same age as some of these kids that were in this hospital. And at the time, I was at ba uh, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland. Um, but I really had a phenomenal experience, and I, I was like, okay, I want to be a doctor. Then I found out, you guys... There's pediatricians that work with, with little kids, but did you know there's neonatologists and they're baby doctors, like the itty bitty ones? And that blew my mind. I'm like, I have to be a neonatologist. So I talked to one of the doctors and I was like, so what does that look like for school? <laughs> it's like it's like 15 years after high school. He was like, well, doopa 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 doo. And I was like, yep, nope, can't do that. Um, so I did go to undergrad um, to be, uh, I was pre-med initially. Um, I was it, I went to undergrad again. I was in Cleveland, Ohio. My undergrad was in Toledo, Ohio. Go Rockets. Um, and it wasn't very far, but I, I, I went to Toledo, um, Toledo because I did actually get into Northwestern and a few other out-of-state schools, um, but I went on scholarship. Um, I was the person trying to get all the things. Um, and honestly, I, I was an overachiever perfectionist because I was the only kid of color, and I knew I had to do things three times better. And even when I did it three times better and got the scholarship, I was constantly being told, like, oh, you just got that because you're black. You just got that because you're a female. You just got that as a, you know, um, affirmative action thing. So that was really challenging for me um, to be to constantly feeling like I have to prove myself and prove myself. I'm, I'm getting I'm recovering overachiever now, but um, that's still like in me a lot. So um, but I. I got a leadership scholarship to go to undergrad. I was one of 50 students um, chosen. We had to do a whole song and dance essay thing. Um, but during that time, what that meant was our 50-person cohort got to take classes in leadership. And what that did for me was really um, destigmatize, like how to be, be in the same spaces with people that are at higher levels than me or higher levels of authority. Um, so we would go to the president's house and have lunch. So it really made like the president of the university is just a dude whose bathroom kind of smells weird, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like I, it really like brought down. So now I feel comfortable in a boardroom and in a homeless shelter, right? Like there's no barrier where I feel like intimidated by authority because like their feet smell just like ours. Um, but I really appreciated that learning um, because again, it, it made it so that I'm less intimidated by positions of power. Um, and one of the, so I got my undergrad degree. Initially I was pre-med, I failed a chemistry class. And then my counselor told me, you're never going to get into med school. So I changed my, uh, my major to communications. Um, and I figured, OK, this is general enough. I could go into PR. I could go into marketing. I kind of didn't really have exactly what I wanted to do at the time. Um, and I graduated with a communication degree. I graduated in three years because I had taken college classes in high school. I told you I was a nerd, overachiever. Um, but what happened was I graduated and this is another thing I would recommend, and I know you mentioned it, but living with someone else, having a roommate or going back home and living and saving money is really helpful. I didn't go back home because I didn't want to go back home, but I went to my aunt's house. So I moved to Columbus, Ohio, um, and lived with my aunt and uncle and my cousins for about two years after undergrad. And what I did with my communication degree was that I, I wanted to work either I, – I wanted to still use my communication degree either in the um, – 
medical field or in what I pivoted to was child abuse. My aunt at the time was working for Child Abuse uh, Ohio and doing a lot of like logo design and um, actually the Ohio license plate that's for children, my aunt designed that one. Um, and so she was doing a lot of those kind of campaigns and I would just shadow her. I followed her around um, to her meetings at, you know, at different children's hospitals or different organizations. And she, at the time, was doing a newsletter for CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, um, which is a national nonprofit, but they have um, local nonprofits. So there is one here in Silicon Valley in Milpitas. Um, but she was working for the one in uh, Franklin County, Columbus, Ohio. So I started as an intern there. I think I made probably $11,000 the first year. But again, I was living with my aunt, so you know, I, was, I had all my major needs met. Then they hired me um, as a communication person for CASA. Uh, I was making a whopping 21000 a year. Thought I'd made the big leagues. <laughs> um, still living with my aunt because, again, couldn't afford rent on my own. But at that point, I, for working for CASA, I was training volunteers to advocate for foster youth. I was also sitting in court hearings um, with foster youth, with attorneys, with judges. And that's where I really got exposed to social work. And that's where I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to help support these kids. Because I did see that when I was working in the hospital um, Often I would see a, a, an infant being born addicted to drugs and then, you know, the social workers come in and, and maybe a foster parent come in and take that baby. Um, there were occasionally times even with the, the older teenagers that I was working with where there'd be a foster parent involved or, you know, some kind of CPS action at the hospital, right, because they're all mandated reporters and that's sometimes when abuse is being discovered. Uh, so I was aware of foster care in general, but it wasn't until I worked for CASA that I was like, oh, this is what this is and this is what it looks like. So initially, I, so I worked for CASA for two years. I initially thought, um, oh, and you'll appreciate this. I, I, I made these brand new things for them that they were, didn't even know what it was, but they knew it could really be helpful, and that was a website. <laughs> <laughs> Their very first website <laughs> in the 1990s. Um, the 1900s, as, as the kids say today. <laughs> so disrespectful. So disrespectful. Um, but I actually thought I wanted to be a lawyer, because I'm like, I want to protect kids. I want to advocate for kids. I want to be a lawyer. So I took some of the attorneys to lunch, and what they told me I will never forget. They said, Nicole, the law does not protect children. So if you really want to protect, and, and if you, once you learn the law, you have to abide by the law. But the law does not protect children. So if you really want to protect children, go to social work, because you, you, you can do whatever those kids need, and you can say, oh, I didn't know I couldn't do that. You know? um, so I, I took that, because I was thinking law school, and, and I was like, no, actually, I'll do social work. So I applied um, to different social work schools. I applied to ones that didn't require the GRE, because <laughs> I, I didn't want to have to take another test. Um, so UConn, I went to UConn, University of Connecticut, go Huskies. Um, so I went to UConn f uh, for my master's degree. And I, everyone on the panel has said, like, take it step by step and just know, like, know in general what you want to do, but know that you don't have to have that concrete path. And I say that because I remember sitting in my very first graduate program, or my very first graduate class and thinking, oh my God, two years is going to take forever. And now I'm like a lot, like 15 years out from that. And I'm like, wow, you know, I, that was that was just a blink. So as you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I have four years or I have two years or whatever that looks like, just remember you'll get there and then you'll be like, oh my gosh, that was a breeze. And you're going to, you're going to live those days in that life anyway. So why not get a degree or why not like, you know, invest in yourself while you're doing it? Um, so, and I, I will say my UConn program for Master's of Social Work um, had multiple tracks. So I actually did the admin track where I was learning macro social work. So how to run a nonprofit, how to create a board or train a, a board of directors, how to write grants. Um, and that really served me well. I, the one thing I will say, and I think it's been said here too, is as you're going along, if you have an opportunity to get a certification or a certificate or a credential, do it. Even if you think I'm not gonna work in that field or uh, if it's like one extra class you have to take or a few extra volunteer hours, please do it. I did not get my PPSC when I was getting my master's because I was like, I'm not gonna be in schools. I wanna do nonprofit and rape crisis work or domestic violence work or child abuse work. I'm not gonna be in schools. Um, and I really wish I had done my, because it was literally like two extra classes I could have taken and had it done. Instead, I finished, graduated, and then had to go back to San Jose State and pay for my post-master's PPSC. And that, you know, had to pay for that out of pocket. Um, so if there's something you can do while you're still in school and you have that financial aid or you have that support or you're just in that mindset, go for it. You, again, even if it's like, ah, I'm never going to use that, like, elder care or whatever, or I'm never going to use that school, whatever, or that substance use, whatever, um, I would say go for it. Um, I 
so UConn I, was really helpful. And then from UConn, I, I had an internship while I was there with a rape crisis center, which is how I got my job then doing rape crisis in the state of Connecticut. Um, did a lot of research with professors. And again, I would say get a good mentor, ask a lot of questions. They, they, professors love when students want more of them. Not that, you, like, not boundaryless, but like that you're like, I'm curious about this or I want to go to grad school. How do I do that? Um, it's, sometimes it's an ego thing for them, but you know, feed it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> make it work for you, win win. Why are you looking at me? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but truly, I, I found folks who. I would observe them in class and, and I appreciated how they showed up and I appreciated the way they spoke about the work they did. And those are the people I found office hours for. And I just said, you know, I wanna sit and absorb from you. Um, and I had one professor, Dr. Eleanor Lyon, who did a lot of work around domestic violence. Um, and I worked with her. Uh, we actually did a lot of sex offender research. And again, the goal of reviewing sex offender case files and interviewing them about their crimes was to figure out what do, how do we prevent this and how, what do we tell parents to how to keep their kids safe based on what these people have done? Um, that was part of the burnout that I experienced, certainly, as you can imagine. Um, but I really appreciated the ways that I was given opportunities to engage in research. We did another um, series of research around family uh, reunification in foster care because that was around the time where um, we were starting to shorten the amount of time that parents had to regain their children when they lost them to the system. A lot of that around substance use, right? Substance abuse is, a, is an up and down and recovery is really challenging for parents. So giving them enough time to get clean and get their kids back versus how long is too long. And it was a good conversation back then about that. Um, once I finished, um, well, I would say, social, again, social work is a very broad career, especially now. And I say I think the trajectory of social work is expanding because schools are starting to realize how important it is to have social workers. Um, hospitals always have social workers. Even I know funeral homes that hire a social worker, right, to help the family through that process, which is a beautiful idea. There is macro and micro social work. So some of us, when we think of social work, think of CPS, right, or caseworkers. Certainly there's that. Um, but there's also macro social work, so doing more of the policy level things, the nonprofit pieces, um, community health pieces. So you can kind of find your niche wherever you are. I would also say a lot of my jobs, once I came to California, again, my husband came for his job, I got a job in the school, and again, I, I actually went back to my communication degree. My first job here in California was as a PIO, public information officer for Fremont Unified School District. Um, so again, I was doing all the websites, I was doing all the press releases, I was handling you know, high level challenges. I did get a pink slip from that job because during the recession, 2009, have it framed in my office. And it, they actually printed on pink paper, y'all. <laughs> it's legit, like you get, you're fired on pink, on pink paper. It's very pretty. Um, and even, I will say, even in my, my meeting with HR where they were telling me I was fired, I was counseling the people that were telling me because they were crying about it. <laughs> like, we're so sorry, we have to tell you. I'm like, it's okay, tell me how you're feeling. <laughs> Um, so, but, and then my next job was in Pleasanton Unified, doing also communication work, but that, that superintendent that I worked for knew that I was a social worker. So that's when I started getting pulled into interventions and, and restorative justice practices and things like that. This job I have now is in Milpitas Unified, um, and I've been there eight years now, and I'm actually officially a school social worker. Um, and we also have a wellness center that we've just opened this year. I'm thrilled about that. It's at our high school. Um, also doing a lot of risk assessments. Uh, we did have, we have had suicides at our school and that has been really challenging, including one last year. Um, and Herd Alliance and the county have, have come in and they're literally on the phone with us as we're triaging with students and figuring out what, what, where we go from here. Um, so that's been super helpful. Uh, job security is, is a challenge with social work and I think with any soft science, um, only because well, it depends where you are. If you're like a DCF social worker, everybody's a social worker, everybody's social work in there. So it's more about seniority, like for first, last in, last, first out is usually the way that works. But I have found um, sometimes you'll be the only person with your degree or your, your expertise at your agency, and it's easy to cut that. Um, I think it's easy to cut the folks who don't necessarily generate income. So that's where my grant writing skills came in. So anytime there was a like, eh, or I you know, don't know if we can keep you, I'd be like, well, here, let me write a grant for you. Here's $500,000, and now you can keep me and hire some more. Um, so that's been really helpful. And, and I think in the last five years, there's been a, a push for more social work. So there are people leaving the profession. Teachers are leaving, nurses are leaving, doctors are leaving, social workers are leaving because the pandemic was a shit show, pardon my language. 
Um, and we're still recovering from it in it. Um, but I think, I think with social work, there is a, a, an upward trajectory because there is such a need and people are seeing, especially from the pandemic, people are seeing a need for therapists <coughs> and social workers. Um, as a social worker, I also got my, I, I'm actually going to pursue my LCSW, my clinical license, because I realized the need. Um, I wasn't going to for the same reasons. I was like, you know, I, I don't know that I want to have to diagnose someone via the DSM-5, right? That's very, um, a little too rigid and trauma is still not in there all fully. Childhood trauma is a little bit in there, but not fully. Um, and I'm realizing, you know, that's that's the need and I want to pivot that way. And I, I do have a breadth of experience, especially, you know, I think there's a lot of folks that don't want to deal with rape crisis or don't want to deal with domestic violence or don't want to deal with suicidality and that stuff doesn't scare me. So um, that's my next quest. But I, um, I did pay through loans and scholarships. I would encourage you, there's so many scholarships out there, y'all. Um, some of them are specifically for community college students. And also, like, you can find very, like, right-handed brunette who is the oldest child in a family of seven. Like, right? They, some of these scholarships are super specific. Um, and I really encourage you to go for any, any, you know, I had $100 scholarships. I had a few 500, a few thousand, right? And they add up. Because um, some people are like, I don't, I won't do it until it's a $5,000 or $20,000 scholarship. Um, but there are always scholarships, and there are always scholarships beyond your freshman year. Um, again, there are some scholarships specifically for transfer students, specifically for older adults with families who are coming back to school. Um, and you can Google them. There's also a book of scholarships. I get buy that book every year for my high school kids. Um, it's alphabetical, but literally there's so many scholarships. So I encourage you, um, write 20 essay, you know, you can write the same essay and, and kind of put it out there for a few different ones. I did have to take out loans. Um, and I just got my PSLF con confirmation the same day I got my clean mammogram confirmation. So I was like, literally the two pieces of mail were your mammogram's clean and your loans are forgiven. Wow. Yay. Um, because I've worked 10 years and it doesn't have to be the same public agency. So again, I've worked in three different public, uh, public school districts, but I've been in them for 14 years. So you have to work in, in a public institution for 10 years, make up to 120 payments unmissed. And that's what I've done. Um, so I got my, my husband and I both have gotten our loans wiped. So, um, I, for my income, um, I might be a unique situation in that I have doubled my income with every job. So my first job was 11,000, then 21, then 40. And I thought again, that was woo, making the big bucks. Um, and then when I moved to California because of the cost of living, my next job, my job in Fremont was $80,000, which I was like, I am rich. And then I moved here, you know, then I was here and I was like, oh, this is not like, this is cute. Uh, this doesn't go very far. So the sticker shock was a bit much. And even again, uh, my husband and I even, I think was six years ago now, uh, we ended up moving in with another couple because we all wanted to save some money. They were also from the East Coast and they're like, well, what is this cost of living? Um, so we all kind of moved in together and were able to save a lot of money that way. Now my husband and I are solo, um, child free at the moment as well. And, um, uh, and that's still a challenge. Like when I go back to Ohio, y'all, it's like I put on my Zillow and I'm like, <laughs> I mean, you can my, like the house next to my father-in-law is like a five bedroom, four bath basement on an acre. And it's like $95,000. Like, that's what I'm talking about. And here it's like, you know, whatever, you know what it is here. But um, um, that said, I, I do make six figures. Part of that is because I negotiate and I do not take, I do not accept what they offer me. I always negotiate higher. Um, stand in your power with that especially if you're going to be the one that one that's the one position of in your area right I knew I was going to be the only social worker so y'all are going to pay me straight up um, and some of that was because of my previous job that I had right I had a job that was good pay so I was able to slide into another one um, and I will say working in schools is phenomenal I highly recommend it even if you don't start your career there like if you want to be a school secretary or like anything in schools because the benefits are amazing. The school year cadence is really nice. My husband and I both are on school years, but all of our vacations are different. <laughs> We've never had a spring break together. Other than Christmas, I think is the only time we actually have together. But everything's staggered, so um, we have we still take vacation. It's not a problem. But um, but being in schools does afford you like yes, the work is exhausting. Um, you, you know, it is also heartbreaking. You have to prepare yourself. Whenever you work with other human beings, there's going to be a level of heartbreak. 
I prepare myself for that. I buffer my heart as much as I can with my meditation practice and my yoga practice. Um, and there are times when I cry myself home to sleep or cry myself home from work, right? Um, there are, I work with our homeless population. I work with our foster youth. Um, all of our kids have really intense stories. And there are just times when I know I've helped as much as I can, but that hasn't solved their problem, right? Like I've done everything I can and that family's still gonna sleep in a shelter tonight. And that breaks my heart. Um, so just accept that in your work. I think that's a good, healthy thing to do. Every, you know, every two weeks I have a good cry. Um, <laughs> but truly allowing yourself to feel all the feels that come up when you are working with someone else or, or other people in their trauma. Um, and then doing your own self-care. I'm, I'm a big proponent of radical self-care. So what are those practices that you have that you do every day that really buoy you? Um, sometimes it's hydration. Sometimes it's breath. Sometimes it's talking to someone you love. Sometimes it's taking a walk in nature. Um, for me, I really try to make my, my life outside of work way more full than my work life. So I can say, oh, that's just work. Um, and really putting boundaries. When I get in my car and I, you know, I'm done with my school day, which sometimes ends at six o'clock for me, sometimes later, um, I sit in my car and I, talk, I think about three things that, that went well that day. And they may be very small wins, like she said, right? It might have just been, that kid made eye contact with me today. <laughs> And the other kid didn't didn't curse me out when I said slow down and the, you know whatever right it's three small things um, and I take a few deep breaths and then I have my commute home um, I always use my commute as a de-escalation for myself or a re-regulation um, it was really awesome when I had a 45 minute commute now I have a 15 minute commute so it's a little shorter but I'll play do a playlist I'll do a podcast sometimes it's just straight silence. Uh, and then when I get home, so I'm not taking my work in with me, because that was a boundary I didn't have when I was a young social worker, I sit in my car, I take five deep breaths, and I think about, you know, how well the day went, and then I'm done. Um, and then I go into my house, and then I'm home and present with my family. And that used to be a challenge, right? My, my husband would say, like, you're not here. You're here, but you're not here. And I wasn't. I was there, but I was thinking about all the things that I needed to do. And the reality is you can't do everything, right? You can do anything, but you can't do everything. And there's a limit to the support that you can provide someone and you have to be okay with that. Um, so I, I do the job to the best of my ability and then I have to let it go and know that people are gonna make their own choices. So I may put a family in a really great situation and then they make choices that pull them out of that. That's not on me, I can't do anything about that. Um, so it's really about how you show up. But I agree, I think asking for mentors, um, asking for support, being aware of how you show up in different spaces because that will also give you networks and, and opportunities. So if you do interview for a job, even if you don't get that job, how you show up in that interview, those people on that panel might call you in for another interview for another position, especially if they move to a different agency. That's the beautiful thing about Jasmine and I. Like we know each other through the work that we do. And and like I today the restorative justice training I was at, some of her colleagues were there, and you know, there's there was a connection of someone I had met presenting at a, at a, at a um, class at UC Berkeley, actually. He's like, I don't think you remember, but I was a principal in that class, and you came with your foster daughter and to talk about you know, the challenges in high school for foster kids. Um, that was a beautiful, that this world is a small world, so I would just say remember that, um, especially as people get on your nerves. <laughs> just, I try to like fix my face, and like, okay, hi, you know, I'm in this space, I don't know who, who I'm gonna find later, right? Um, and there was something else I wanted. Oh, someone mentioned consulting. That's the other thing. Once you have experience in a certain area, trust your expertise and know that there are always room for, for, for you to, sorry, for you to be a consultant. Um, when I had my, got my pink slip, my school district actually hired me as a consultant and ended up paying me more than my salary that year because they didn't have to pay my benefits. So for them, it was a, a win. They, they saved money. But I was like, wait, this math isn't mathing, like how are you paying me more now even though you've got rid of me? But it's because they have money for consulting. And a lot of grants will provide not money for a full-time position, but for consulting. So once you, I would say if you have three to five years solid in a, in a profession or in a specific area, whether it's substance use or uh, <coughs> child development, um, trust your expertise and, and lean on that. And then you can kind of go, schools always hire consultants. Nonprofits usually are the ones that be, are being hired, but there's always grants out there where people need to hire someone who has expertise in a specific field. So definitely um, pull into that when you're able to. I think that's all I needed to say. Yeah. I apologize. I have to leave. I'm visually impaired. I cannot drive when in the dark when headlights are coming toward me. So uh, I have to leave it a little bit early, but I wanted to say that 
<laughs> having been a hiring authority for behavioral health specialists, LMFTs, LCSWs, RNs, MDs, PAs, et cetera, et cetera, it has never been a better time to come into this industry. And more importantly, you will get to work with people like these people. And that's a huge blessing you don't get in other industries. These people are in for it, into it for the dedication, the commitment, and the love. And that's an amazing coworker group to hang out with every day. It's always an honor. So thank you for having us. I got to scoot. Thank you. And, and I want to thank everybody for being here and thank you for being here. You're amazing. So yeah, thank you deeply.